So today's book review is Light from Uncommon Stars by Rika Aoki, and I almost didn't buy this book, but my god I'm glad that I did. So the main character of this novel is a trans girl called Katrina, who runs away from home to escape her father's abusive behaviour. Along with her $30 violin she bought on eBay, very much like this violin. I assume. This cost Lord 30 euros, I bought it on Amazon, and I'm buggered if I know how to play it. It's pretty though. Katrina is noticed by Shizuka, a world-renowned violin player and teacher who sold her soul to the devil and has to now hand over seven souls of her students in order to save hers from damnation. Katrina is the seventh soul. Then there's the alien donut shop. A shop run by Lan Tran and her family who are alien refugees and run the donut shop as a front to build a stargate in order to encourage alien tourism on Earth. The donut shop is actually called Stargate with two R's. And then there's Lucy, an artisan who runs a violin repair store and who believes she can't live up to the mastery of her family name because she's a woman. And all the other side characters and subplots and I couldn't put this book down, it's brilliant. I really loved Katrina the way she's written. So she's a trans girl fleeing from an abusive home. At first she goes to stay with one of her friends, somebody she met at a convention who promised that she could stay with him and that he'd look after her. But that very quickly turns out not to be the case. This person just love bond her and then uses her to get whatever he wants and turns out to be just another abusive person preying on somebody vulnerable. And she ends up playing in a park where Shizuka hears her music and hears that like she has the special thing that makes her a prodigy. She just swoops her up and brings her into a world and she's like, I'm going to make you a star, you're going to be able to live from your music, everybody's going to love you. And she just lets her be herself. And it's really strange given that she's like her goal is to sell her soul to the devil. But this is a choice that like her students make for themselves. It's like a really kind of weird situation, but there's a whole like subplot with one of like um, Shizuka's potential students who should have been her student uh, instead of Katrina and how she is just looking to emulate one of Shizuka's previous students who ended up taking her own life and how she aims to like emulate her taking her own life as well like it's really weird. Points for having the classical music genre uh, being the ones who are selling their souls to the devil because normally it's us metalheads uh, that get blamed for that but apparently they can be just as crazy about fame and fortune as we are allegedly. I also think the whole theme of like the decaying souls of musicians and how they end up being defined by their art, it's something that I don't think we really see anymore, but back in the 1920s and 30s, right up to the 70s, there were these stories of actors or musicians who would like lose at an award ceremony or their career would dry up and they would just end their lives because that's the only thing that defined them. They were nothing if not a musician, if not an actor. They they like couldn't see couldn't see themselves existing outside of their art, if that makes sense. But today it kind of seems to me that musicians have other things going on. Like they're not just defined by this one aspect of their lives. I don't know if I'm making sense right now, but like to me, to me that's really interesting. Uh, a while back I made a video, uh, seven metal bands I think Kate Blanchett might like after what she said to Margot Robbie on the Graham Norton show. And on that Graham Norton show, Margot Robbie was there to promote her movie Babylon. And that is what that movie is about. And I, I recommend it because I actually thought I went and watched it and I thought it was really good. And it is about 1920s cinema and what it was like for like certain key figures in Hollywood. 
and the like sound coming into movies and all the differences and changes that that made and the the actors that portrayed who were real people and obviously like this is a uh, movie fantasy of what may have happened but these were people who did end their lives uh, because their careers dried up and there was nothing else going for them as it were it's it's very interesting um you know we have a very famous case in france of dalida whose boyfriend or fiance ended his life because he didn't win an award for one of his songs it was won by somebody else like imagine today taylor swift um going into a hotel room and just ending it because um she didn't get the grammy that lady gaga got or something like it just seems completely crazy today but this was very much a thing but getting back to katrina another thing that rika yoki did extremely well is to put her depression like katrina's depression into words and that is something that is supremely hard to do and often like messed up in writing because it is extremely hard to put depression across to somebody who's never had it like if you've had depression if you've had suicidal thoughts if you've had those voices in your head you know what it's like identify with it but if you've never had that trying to explain what it's like to have this voice in your head every single day that tells you that you're a piece of shit that you don't deserve the air that you breathe that the world would be better off without you is extremely hard for people to understand to like grasp the concept that your brain would be doing things without you having any kind of control over it and i think that kind of goes to every single mental health issue um regardless of what it is it's like just your brain doing stuff on its own and you have no control over it and for somebody who's never been through that it can be extremely hard to understand Rika Aoki just puts this through so well on the page like props to you I love it and I think it also really helps putting across how a trans person would feel like in a world who doesn't really understand or accept what they are now let's talk about that Lantran and the donut shop so Lantran has four children and they all like have their different issues. They have to deal with like relocating to Earth and being in a society that like doesn't really, I mean, obviously they don't know that they're aliens, but like they still sort of stand out in their way. And like every single family member like, has their own kind of subplot of how they deal with this and how they deal with the donut shop and what they want to achieve. But the one that I found most interesting was Marcus, the eldest son, because he is very much going through a crisis. Like, he wants to... Because, like, there's a whole, like, galactic war thing going on, and these, so these people are refugees, and Marcus wants to go and fight. He wants to go and fight with his dad, who stayed behind, and he doesn't deal well with the disrespect that certain customers give uh, him and his family, which is just something that comes with working in retail i'm afraid it sucks and it should be different like people should learn to just fucking have some respect for other human beings but that's not the world we live in unfortunately and he ends up murdering two people and the thing that i found most interesting about this is the family kind of come together and they're just like what do we do what do we do with this kid he's an adult now he's capable of making his own decisions but he's clearly very dangerous he's clearly unhinged and they don't find a solution for him they put him in stasis and they're like do we send him back to his dad do we just leave him that way do we try and figure it out like what do we do and they don't find a solution and they i think it's just an interesting way of saying sometimes the parents can't cope with whatever it is that the children are doing because there is this kind of notion in society that whenever a child fucks up in whatever way it's automatically the parents fault completely regardless of any other exterior factor or interior facts like anything it's like no it's the, the parents get blamed it's the parents fault and the parents failed but like children don't come with manuals and there are so many other exterior influences and it's really interesting now because now uh, the whole like soft parenting thing has come full circle and we're actually getting reports uh, from child therapists of how badly it can go for certain children and that they're actually turning into uh, kids with 
quite severe personality disorders because of this type of education. And I find that really interesting. And it, the other thing is like, there is kind of no one size fits all when it comes to raising kids. And this is something that should be acknowledged more. Like you can't just put one method and apply it to all kids because guess what all kids are different and they all understand things differently and react to things differently and think differently because they are independent individual human beings but what do i know i just thought it was a subplot that had like could open up really interesting discussions surrounding this type of uh, issue and then there's Lucy, who owns the violin store and uh, repairs violins, or at least Shizuka convinces her to repair violins and to look after Katrina's violin, even though Lucy is convinced that she is incapable of this, because she had to, she has to bear this insane family legacy of master violin makers and repairers but she was always told that she couldn't do it because she was a girl and you don't girls don't do that and this isn't for girls and she was always pushed to one side and she was it she was like the shame of the family the black sheep of the family because she was a girl and she couldn't continue the legacy and it brings up like an interesting discussion about uh, violin makers in the past uh, including Stradivarius, whose wife built violins apparently better than he did. Uh, and it's interesting, but these women were pushed to one side because they were women. And how this hereditary, this like, hereditary misogyny is just still plaguing society. So the whole like notion of transphobia and misogyny is omnipresent in this novel even though it apart from with lucy's character it doesn't really get addressed but it's always there and it's interesting how like, most of the characters are women in this book and how they all have to deal with uh, the pressures of misogyny in diff like different ways depending on what they do but lucy really does kind of carry the bigger weight of that because she has actually had it rammed into her brain by her actual family you are a girl you are incapable of doing this and she has to go on her own journey uh, spurred by shizuka to overcome that and she does a monumental job of it and she very much represents that you know if you if you want to move on in life if you want to get over your um stigmas traumas issues whatever you, the really the only person who can do that is you and Lucy very much stands firm in that representation. I love it. And the last thing I want to just kind of gloss over quickly is the actual music. Because obviously uh, we're talking about violinists. So primarily this book focuses on classical music, but also on video game music as well. Because I think you know, video game music just gets forgotten when it comes to... Uh, like composing music like we, we hear about classical music we hear about film music but video game music just kind of goes nah don't care not bothered but that's what Katrina does that's what she plays online she she has a like little YouTube channel and she records video game music and she has her own little following of people who love to hear her play these things and like seriously, if you have never heard music from Two Steps From Hell, you have not lived. And one of my absolute favourite composers, like metal composers, is also a video game composer. So yeah, it's lovely that this book acknowledges that these worlds can coexist and they are not mutually exclusive. Just from a purely uh, like reader's point of view, this book is beautifully written. Rikoyoki has this incredible poetry to her writing it's extremely fluid it's very very beautiful she's very precise she's very to the point but she also leaves enough room for descriptions which i appreciate immensely this is one of the best sci-fi novels i've read like that's been published in the last 10 years i was super super impressed 
do not regret buying this at all i probably i even want to read it again like i'm not the type of person who rereads novels because i have such a massive tbr mountain that i just don't have time but i think i will read this one again because i enjoyed it so much so i don't i don't even want to give it five stars i want to give it six stars it is so good and i strongly strongly recommend this and i am very much looking forward to Rico Yoki's writing from the future so that was light from uncommon stars by rika aoki one of my favorite sci-fi novels ever so that's it for this video tell me if you read this book what you thought of it thank you so so much for watching don't forget to like share comment and subscribe and i'll see you all on the next one bye bye